Welcome back to Brainwaves. I'm Jim Siegler. I'll be your host, and today I'll be speaking with Dr. Ali Hamidani, codename Hammy, and we'll be talking about painless ophthalmoparesis. So welcome to the show, Ali. Thanks for having me, Jim. So what I'd like to do today is start with a case. If we can, we'll discuss the case of a patient and see how it evolves with time and see how it changes your differential diagnosis and go through causes of painless ophthalmoparesis. Let's get started. A 40-year-old woman without any medical history presents to the ED with two days of progressively worsening diplopia. The diplopia is described as binocular in horizontal and vertical planes, and it improves with left and downward gaze deviation. Her exam is notable for intact visual fields to confrontation with normal acuity and no APD. There was no lid ptosis, and the pupils were reactive and symmetric. There's exodeviation of the left eye with right eye hypertropia. Ductions were normal in the right eye, but the left eye has impaired AD duction, as well as impairment in up gaze and down gaze, but AB duction is spared. So where would you localize this lesion? So I think it's really helpful when trying to localize neurothalmic lesions or lesions that produce efferent ocular motor problems to specific muscles. Um, I know it sounds really basic, but I think even if you've been doing it for a while, it can be really helpful. Let me interject here and say that Ali Hamidani is probably the smartest guy that I know. He received his medical degree from the University of Maryland, a Master's of Health Science from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and he carries a Master's in making your attendings look like medical students on rounds. After he graduates from Penn, he will go on to do a Neuro-Ophthalmology Fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania, followed by a Fellowship in Movement Disorders, and then probably run for president. So Jim mentioned uh, that there was an exodeviation of the left eye, suggesting weakness of the medial rectus muscle. Uh, the ductions were normal in the right eye, but the left eye had impaired a deduction, again going with a weakness of the medial rectus. Up gaze and down gaze were both impaired in the left eye, suggesting weakness of primarily the superior and inferior rectus muscles. Uh, and he specifically says that abduction is spared, suggesting that the lateral rectus is normal. Given that the medial, superior, and inferior rectus are all innervated by the cranial nerve 3, ocular motor nerve, and that the sixth nerve uh, is spared, you know, the sixth nerve uh, innervating the lateral rectus, which does abduction, um, this sounds a lot like a third nerve palsy. A um, couple of things that might try to kind of dissuade us from thinking about that. So Jim mentioned that the lids were normal. Ideally, we'd see ptosis in a third nerve palsy, but um, you don't have to have all functions of the third nerve affected, so that doesn't rule out a third nerve palsy. He also mentioned that the pupillary function was normal. As we'll talk about later, um, the pupil can be affected in third nerve palsies, but doesn't have to be, and depending on the cause, it can be more or less likely to be affected. Back to the point you made about the ptosis being an element in third nerve palsies that doesn't always have to be present, does it have something to do with the way that the branch to the levator palpebrae comes off and could be selectively spared in third nerve lesions? I think it could. So, for example, once the third nerve enters the orbit, it splits into two big divisions, the superior division and inferior division. Um, the superior division innervates the levator and the superior rectus, and then the inferior division does everything else. So you could have an inferior divisional third nerve palsy, where you'd have everything affected but the superior rectus and the levator. I think even if that weren't the case, though, it's a big nerve. It has a lot of different fibers going to a lot of different things. The nucleus in the brainstem is also very large, so um, lesions can be small enough to affect some functions and not others. And then you also kind of touched on the parasympathetic function of the third nerve. Can you speak more towards how the lack of that involvement in this patient may guide you towards uh, localizing the lesion? It's a separate set of nuclei that control pupillary function of the third nerve, the Edinger-Westphal nucleus. It's located very close to the ocular motor uh, nuclei that control the ocular muscles, but it is separate, so you could have a lesion affecting one part of the brainstem, but not the other. Brain At this the, point, Ali also describes to me several of the important subnuclei of the third nerve. For instance, fibers from the superior rectus subnucleus pass through the contralateral superior rectus subnucleus before joining that third nerve fascicle, which innervates the contralateral superior rectus muscles. Also, there's a single central caudal subnucleus which subserves both levator muscles. Try saying that one five times fast. It would be unusual, however, for a single lesion to affect the CCN without other long tract or cranial nerve abnormalities. Uh, along the peripheral third nerve, the parasympathetic fibers run along the outside of the nerve, and the ocular motor fibers along the inside. So typically, compressive lesions will produce more pupillary involvement than intrinsic lesions that sort of arise from within the nerve itself. And besides this being a muscle or nerve lesion, can you think of any other cause of this person's diplopia? Uh, yeah, so I guess just kind of tracing the course of the third nerve itself. 
um, because uh, in this case we have disconjugate eye movements or motility that's impaired in one eye and normal in the other, we have to be either at the level of the brainstem nuclei or distal to it. In other words, a lesion of the PPRF or other brainstem nuclei like the interstitial nucleus of Cajal or the RIMLF or any other things you may have seen in neuroanatomy textbooks wouldn't be expected to be affected here because those would give you conjugate gaze palsies. Um, but in this case, we know that we're distal to those. So this could be a lesion of the ocular motor brainstem nucleus, or really it's a complex of nuclei. This could be the fascicles of, the, of those nuclei as they exit the brainstem, the peripheral third nerve itself, as it courses through the subarachnoid space, through the cavernous sinus, at the orbital apex, where it'll then enter the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. It could be at the level of the neuromuscular junction, where each of these uh, nerve fibers innervates the respective muscles that we discussed, and again, at the muscles themselves. At this point, it's still unclear where the lesion could originate from. Let's say that the patient did have pupillary involvement with this possible third nerve lesion. What kinds of pathologic processes can you imagine would occur that would produce a pupil involving third nerve lesion? Sure. So again, I think the pupillary involvement suggests or would raise the suspicion for any sort of compressive lesion. If this were relatively acute in onset, and if it were accompanied by any sort of headache, I think the greatest concern would be for an aneurysm of the circle of Willis compressing the third nerve. Um, usually it's described as a, an aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery, the PCOM. The aneurysm would be close to where it feeds into the posterior cerebral artery. So the third nerve actually runs between the posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebellar artery. So aneurysms in any of those vessels could ca cause compression of the third nerve. But obviously you can have compression from a tumor at the, the prepontine cistern, could be in the cavernous sinus or in the orbit or anywhere else. Okay, so your differential is largely comprised of neoplastic or vascular compressive lesions um, and possibly something at the nerve or the neuromuscular junction as well as the muscle. How would you like to proceed with uh, diagnostic testing? So I think just kind of to group all those things together that you talked about, I would I think of dividing the differential into like a true focal lesion of the third nerve or a more diffuse neuromuscular process that just happens to be affecting certain nerves more. Um, so all of the compressive lesions that we talked about um, would go under the former category. You could include brainstem lesions as well, as we said, anything compressive or even intrinsic to the nerve. But then sort of more diffuse processes that are maybe asymmetrically affected would be things like ocular myasthenia, thyroid eye disease, or orbital myositis, sort of things like that. Okay. So I think the first step is, you know, in examining the patient to get a sense as to whether there are any subtle findings to suggest any of those others. So look for any subtle lidtosis or fatigability on exam to suggest ocular myasthenia. You'd look for proptosis, uh, chemosis, or anything else to suggest like a, an orbital pathology like, uh, like thyroid eye disease. And then I think depending on which of uh, those two broad categories you're thinking about, you'd either maybe go with imaging first, or if you're really in the category of more diffuse neuromuscular disease, would think about testing for some of those specific diseases. All right, so let's say that the imaging did show that there is some hypertrophy of the medial rectus, superior, and inferior rectile muscles, but no mass lesion, no vascular lesion. Cool. So if you're invoking hypertrophy of the ocular muscles, first of all, I think one thing that that suggests about our exam is that we've been talking up until now about a weakness of certain muscles, but when you have hypertrophy or, or infiltration on imaging, that suggests that actually the problem might not be paretic, but it might be restrictive. In other words, if the medial rectus muscle is um, enlarged or fibrosed or something like that, you might have physical restriction that limits abduction, which could sort of trick you into thinking that there was actually a sixth nerve palsy or vice versa. Um, so I think when the ocular muscles are enlarged, I mean, there are quite a few things that can infiltrate them. The one that we think about most, probably the most common one is thyroid eye disease. But you can also have orbital myositis, um, not due to thyroid eye disease. That exists on a spectrum of just sort of nonspecific orbital inflammatory syndromes, which are also called like orbital pseudotumor and things like that. You can have sarcoid or lymphoma that also affect the ocular muscles, other kind of histiocytoses and things like that. I think any tumor in the orbit or right behind the orbit could cause a sort of mechanical restriction and limit eye movements. Um, you can have rhabdomyosarcomas of the ocular muscles themselves, which can grow pretty rapidly and can sort of mimic other more acute inflammatory or, or even vascular causes. You can have metastatic disease to the orbit um, that's, as far as I can tell, not any particular neoplasms that are more likely to um, metastasize to the orbit than any other. So just think about the common tumors that metastasize in general, like breast, prostate, lung. To distinguish a paretic from a restrictive cause of a possible ophthalmoparesis, you can test the patient using forced deductions. 
Yeah, so first of all, I think the reason to suspect a restrictive process is if there's other evidence of orbital infiltration or inflammation. So proptosis, eyelid injection, uh, you know, chemosis. Um, you know, sometimes you can see arterialization of the conjunctival blood vessels that can indicate kind of cavernous sinus pathology or something like that. But something to kind of point to a unilateral orbital process. So Jim mentioned forced ductions. The way these work um, is the uh, eye is anesthetized using topical anesthetic eye drops, and the eye is passively moves, moved using Q-tips. And the goal is to determine if the eye can be moved or not. Normally, if someone were weak in a particular direction of movement, you should be able to move their eye over to make up for it. But if they had some restrictive process affecting the contralateral muscle, so for example, if someone had a limitation of abduction, you should be able to passively abduct their eye if it were a paretic process, but you wouldn't be able to if it were a restrictive process. So we think that this is an inflammatory orbitopathy, and how would you like to proceed with other diagnostic testing? But I guess before we go to additional testing, one thing I forgot to mention was in terms of imaging. So MRI can be very helpful in terms of uh, determining the etiology of orbital disease. Uh, Jim had mentioned earlier ocular muscle enlargement. One particular feature about thyroid eye disease is that it causes enlargement of the muscle belly but spares the muscle tendon as it inserts on the eye. Um, so that can be one useful kind of point that points you towards thyroid eye disease. Um, you can use orbital ultrasound too to assess the ocular muscles and other orbital structures. On MRI also, different lesions have different intensities on T1 and T2 weighted images, so sometimes that can be helpful too. Ultimately, if there's some sort of inflammatory lesion of the orbit that's not well-defined, a patient may often end up getting a biopsy. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is to do a good anterior chamber sort of slit lamp exam to see if there's any evidence of uveitis or something else. So that kind of starts to fall into the category of what some people call nonspecific intraorbital inflammation, an IOI, or as I said earlier, orbital pseudotumor. So that's inflammation that's otherwise not due to a clear etiology that can cause uveitis and other sort of you know, inflammatory lesions within the eye, but also cause uh, inflammation of the ocular muscles and periorbital structures. Um, some of these orbital diseases also affect intrinsic eye structures and others don't. Would you test for like antithyrotropin antibodies for thyroid eye disease? Yeah, especially if you were going down the orbital route, you know, and you're thinking about thyroid eye disease, again, the MRI can be helpful in suggesting that. Thyroid eye disease, I wouldn't expect to cause intraocular involvement, like or any uveitis or anything. I should mention that all of these orbital diseases can affect the optic nerve if they're bad enough and they're causing enough inflammation and compression in the retroorbital space. So that's one thing to look out for whenever you're seeing a patient for the first time with ocular motility abnormalities as to see if there's any optic nerve involvement to suggest something structural at the orbital apex or something like that. It's also something to look for as you monitor patients because vision loss you know, would be one of the more worrisome complications of these diseases. So let's rewind and take it back a step and say the head CT, the initial imaging, showed no aneurysm, no vascular malformation, no structural lesion, and the orbit was normal. How would you further evaluate this patient who has a painless appearing third nerve pupil sparing lesion? You know, I think part of it depends on the clinical context, too. This was a 40-year-old woman that this case began with, so probably a little young for an ischemic third nerve palsy, but uh, in an older person with vascular risk factors, if imaging is otherwise unrevealing, that often ends up being the sort of diagnosis of exclusion. So you can get ischemic cranial nerve palsies that are thought to be due to diabetes, hypertension, and other vascular risk factors. In an older person, you might also be worried about giant cell arteritis as a cause of ischemic uh, cranial nerve palsy. So that would be something th to think about too. In a younger person, differential is a focal lesion of the third nerve, which we would evaluate with MRI of the brain in orbit, or a more diffuse process that just happens to be affecting muscles more than, more than others. Um, and so those would be things like ocular myasthenia, thyroid eye disease, uh, Wernicke's encephalopathy in the right context, or things like that. So the patient is uh, appropriately nourished and hydrated, and you treat them with you know, high doses of IV thiamine for possible Wernicke's encephalopathy, and then you proceed with an EMG. What would you expect to find on the EMG? It sounds like this is looking mostly for ocular myasthenia. So obviously it's a pretty difficult, if not impossible, to EMG the ocular muscles themselves. So you would start with a an EMG of the, of the facial muscles as well as the arm and leg. Um, often in ocular myasthenia, these are normal, uh, and that's because uh, either their weakness, appendicular weakness may be very minimal or may be absent entirely. So um, about 50% of patients with myasthenia have purely ocular myasthenia. 
And of these patients, a good number of them, maybe about half to a, a third, will remain ocular will never generalize. And then others will generalize usually within the first two years after diagnosis. So you would uh, obtain a standard EMG and nerve conduction study with a repetitive stimulation. And if that were normal, um, the next step would be a single fiber EMG. So the single fiber EMG shows what's called jitter. Can you tell us about jitter? Yeah, so um, single fiber EMG, as its name kind of implies, involves the stimulation of a single axon of a lower motor neuron that uh, innervates a group of muscle fibers. And it basically records the depolarization of two different muscle fibers that are both innervated by the same axon. So if uh, motor nerve conduction and conduction across the neuromuscular junction is normal, you'd expect those two fibers to depolarize at the same time. In any neuromuscular junction disease, uh, you can have jitter, which is basically when there's a delay in the depolarization of one muscle fiber compared to another. Before you proceed with a single fiber EMG, it's always important to do a routine EMG to exclude other causes of peripheral neuropathy and myopathy. Only after doing a routine EMG will you be able to fully interpret the results of a single fiber test. So single fiber EMG should really only be to look for myasthenia in an otherwise normal neuromuscular uh, exam and um, an EMG. If the patient that we're talking about doesn't have a lesion at the neuromuscular junction from ocular myasthenia, for example, then what other kinds of peripheral nerve or neuromuscular junction disorders could you imagine? Yeah, so in general, I guess when we think of peripheral neuropathy, most of those don't affect the eye muscle so much. I think part of it is that a lot of the peripheral neuropathies that we think about are length dependent, and the cranial nerves are relatively short in length. Some exceptions would be certain variants of the Guillain-Barre syndrome, in particular uh, Miller-Fisher, which uh, has the triad of ophthalmoparesis, a sensory ataxia, and areflexia. There's a chronic version, basically a chronic version of Miller-Fisher called Canamad that has sort of a similar features but over a more extended period of time. And it has a different set of antibodies that it's associated with. If you are highly suspicious that this is a Miller-Fisher variant of Guillain-Barre, what kind of diagnostic test would you send? Uh, so the specific antibodies that are associated with Miller-Fisher are um, GQ1B antiganglioside antibodies, um, which are actually quite sensitive for Miller-Fisher syndrome. Um, so you send the GQ1B antibody, and it's pending, but in the meantime, you find that the protein is elevated at 90 milligrams, and the CSF white blood cell count is normal. So what Jim is describing is albuminocytologic dissociation in CSF, where you have elevated protein but normal cells. I think if you have that finding, plus uh, an exam that suggests Miller-Fisher syndrome, uh, it would be appropriate to go ahead and begin treatment with uh, IVIG. Excellent. Let's take this case another direction. So say this person has uh, the same painless ophthalmoparesis that began acutely. The patient had an MRI that was concerning for restricted diffusion at the level of the midbrain. What types of midbrain syndromes do you see with painless ophthalmoparesis? So the, the fibers of the third nerve, as they exit the midbrain into the interpeduncular cistern, they actually pass through the cerebral peduncles. So you can have a lesion uh, an ischemic lesion that affects those fibers as well as the cerebral peduncles, which contain the descending corticospinal tracts. Uh, and the result would be an ipsilateral third nerve palsy and a contralateral hemiparesis. Um, that's called a Weber syndrome. Uh, you can also have variations on that where you hit the red nucleus and other midbrain structures that give you contralateral hemiatis. This is the part where Ali goes into the eponyms for midbrain vascular lesions. He's already described the Weber syndrome ipsilateral cranial nerve 3 nuclear palsy with contralateral weakness from the descending corticospinal tract at the cerebral peduncles. Other syndromes include the Claude syndrome, which is caused by a lesion of the third nerve nucleus, as well as the red nucleus and cerebral peduncles causing contralateral tremor and ataxia, with or without weakness and numbness. And finally, the Benedict syndrome, which produces an ipsilateral third nerve palsy, as well as contralateral ataxia with chorea and hemisensory loss. So you can have a midbrain lesion that gives you bilateral ptosis. Um, the reason is that there's actually a single nucleus in the brainstem that innervates both uh, levator palpebrae, it's called the central caudal nucleus of the midbrain. So if you have a, a midline a midbrain lesion, midline midbrain, uh, you can get bilateral ptosis. Um, the other thing you can get is actually weakness of the inferior and medial rectus uh, and inferior oblique muscles on one side and weakness of the contralateral superior rectus muscle. Um, the reason is that the superior rectus subnucleus actually innervates the contralateral 
superior rectus, as opposed to all of the other subnuclei that innervate the ipsilateral muscles. Um, so you can get some funny patterns uh, with midbrain lesions. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Dr. Hamadani? Not that I can think of. Okay. Their ophthalmology is awesome. Indeed it is. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Anytime. That's it for Brainwaves. We'll talk to you later. Thanks for listening to Brainwaves today. If you like what you just heard, you can find more related material on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio or contact us at bweditorialboard at gmail.com. Be sure to check out our iTunes archive for older episodes. This episode was produced by Jim Siegler. Music by Josh Woodward. Join us next time for another edition of Brainwaves. Jim Siegler here again. I'd also like to give a shout out to someone who's been working from behind the scenes and has been monumental to the success of this podcast, Erica Mejia. She has assisted with many of the voiceovers for all of these episodes, and from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Is uh, someone from Neuropathy going to listen to this?